Let's look at an example showing how to use the web test plugins. To get started with this demo, we're going to add a web test plugin. So we're going to right click on our test project and add a new item. And we're going to look for a plugin. Now I've already added the templates from teamtestplugins.codeplex.com, so you can see that they're listed here. And we're going to add a web test plugin. And then let's just look at the code that this provides. You can see we've got a few regions here. We can specify the display name and description of what this plugin does. We have a constructor. We have some properties that show how we can set these up. The cool thing about these plugins is that the public properties in this class will show up in the Visual Studio user interface. So when we add a property here, if we set these particular attributes, we'll be able to set these properties within our web tests for this plugin. So now let's go ahead and look at one of our existing tests. We have this Browse Add to Cart web test. And if we look at the properties of this web test in the properties dialog, we'll see that it has a number of different properties here. One of them is a proxy server, which is the name of whatever web proxy we want to have. Now, if we want to set this dynamically from a plugin, we can do that by adding it as a property on our web test plugin. Another thing that we could do if we wanted is specify some kind of behavior to apply to every one of these web requests that, if, uh, that take place on this test. We could also add behavior that applies to the test as a whole. So let's look at what we might do to add that. The first thing we would do is add a property that represents the one that we want to show. And in this case, we're going to make that the proxy server. And so for that proxy server, I've got a property already set up that looks like this. And so we can say, here's our proxy server. And this is the proxy server, if any, that we're going to use. Now, if we look at the methods, you'll see that there are methods now for a number of different pre and post settings. We'll look at them up here. You can see there's page, request, transaction, and web test with post as well as pre options. In the case of this proxy, we want to set that in our pre-web test. So if we look at pre-web test, we see it has some event args. Off of that, there's a web test and a proxy. And we can just set that to be this.proxy, which is our value that we set. And if we now build our test and add it to this particular web test, we can now add a web test plugin. And in the web test plugin, you can see it has the proxy server set up. And we could set this to be localhost, for instance. And now we have this proxy server is set. And when we run this test, that proxy server will be used in place of whichever one might have been set here. So if we wanted to make this somehow dynamic, uh, we could do so. So that's one way that you can uh, modify test behavior with a web test plugin. Another thing we might do is we could specify perhaps how long the test can run without failing. And so if we look again at our properties of our test, you can see that it, it does not have any sort of behavior that, to handle that right now. You can specify some kind of validation rules or some kind of response time uh, or timeout on individual requests, but on the test as a whole, there's no way to set any sort of a time period that it must pass in uh, overall. So if we wanted to do that, we would want to add a few things to this test. We'd want to come in here and add a timer, or in this case, a stopwatch. And so the stopwatch we would just put as a private member variable. And then we'd want to set that up inside the constructor. So we'll just new it up here and say stopwatch equals new stopwatch. And we'll want to start that when our tests begin. So in our pre-web test, where we set that proxy, the other thing we're going to want to do is start our stopwatch. So we'll do stopwatch.start. And then after the web test is complete, we want to test to see if we manage to do this within a certain threshold. So the next thing we need to do is specify what is that maximum threshold.
And so we'll call that a maximum test time. And we'll set that as another property that we can set. So here I've already created this property. It's called maximum test time. We're going to say that it specifies the maximum time in milliseconds, and it defaults to zero. And we'll use that here in our post web test to specify that if that time has been exceeded and it wasn't set to zero, zero is going to mean there is no maximum, then we'll fail the test. So here we're going to stop the stopwatch. We're going to pull out the elapsed milliseconds off the stopwatch. So the stopwatch elapsed milliseconds, we're just going to set that to a local. We're going to test to see if the user has set a maximum test time uh, greater than zero. We're only going to cause this behavior to occur if that value has been set to something greater than zero. And then if the elapsed milliseconds, the actual time that the test took, exceeds the maximum test time, then we're going to set the web test outcome to be failure. Now if we go back to our web test and look at our plugin after we build, so we'll go ahead and build and then look at that plugin, you'll see immediately that we have our maximum test time. It has this description here telling us what it is. We can say that our maximum test time here is 500 milliseconds and run our test. And our test is going to fail because it's going to take longer than 500 milliseconds. Now, unfortunately, it's not going to give us a very descriptive reason for failing, but if we look at our test results, we'll see that the web test failed as a result of our web test code. And so you can see that that maximum test time did in fact do what it was supposed to do. If we set that to zero then, which means ignore and rerun our test, you can see that it passes. Now, one more thing that we could do in our web test plugin is specify whether or not we want to parse dependent requests. So if we look at each one of these individual web requests, you can see that it has a parse dependent request property, and that is set to true. Uh, we can change it on individual requests using this property, but we may want to change it at the whole test level so that we don't have to change it for each one of those. So another plugin value that we could set is a Boolean on whether or not we should parse dependent requests. And we would simply add that as another property. And so we would have now at the plugin level, this property here that says parse dependent requests for the whole test. And then to use that, we would go in on a pre-request basis. So we would find the correct method. In this case, we're looking for pre-request and we would set each request's parse dependent requests property to be the one on our plugin. Now we can go back to our test, check the plugin, set this value here to be false, for instance. And if we run this test, we will see now that we don't see any of the dependent requests, such as the style sheets and things like that. If we come back here and set this to true, run the test again, you see that we do get the style sheets and the jQuery, and we get the full uh, skinned version of the page. So you may find, uh, depending on what you're testing, that sometimes you want to ignore these dependent requests, and it could be handy for you to be able to set that with a plugin at the whole test level rather than having to do it for each individual request. So that's web test plugins. Now let's look at how we can add a web request plugin. So if we come back here and do another add new item and look for the web test request plugin, we'll add one of those and then let's look at what it gives us. It's very similar. This is coming from the same template that we got from CodePlex and you'll see that it has the same sort of properties set up for us and some overrides. In this case, it's much simpler. It only has a pre-request and a post-request. For this example, let's say that we wanted to just add some logging around these particular requests. So we might create a little log method in our test helper. We'll add a class here that does this for us and we'll just call it 
log helper and we'll give it a, a little static method that looks like this. All right, so now we have a public static log method that's simply going to pull back the name of the method that was called. And we're gonna add that in just so we know when each one of these gets called. So on our post request or pre-request, we'll call that log helper, log that method. And we'll do the same on the post request. And then if we wanted to debug one of our web tests, we can come into a particular request here and right click on it and say add a uh, request plugin. And we'll find our web test request plugin here. Say OK. And then we can run our test. Now what this is going to let us do is use a tool like debug view and debug view is a handy tool you can get from sysinternals, which is now part of Microsoft's tools. And basically debug view will let you capture and view the uh, debug output from any of your applications on your system. So when we run this test, we'll be able to pull this debug view back up and see these calls that we're now logging. So we'll run this and quickly pull up our debug view. And you can see that we already have some logging set up within the MVC store application. So we've got these repository calls that are logging stuff. And we can also now see that we ran this pre-request and we ran this post-request here as well. So this is showing us simply that these things ran and, and when they ran. So we can see how much time these took. Now they only applied to that one request. If we wanted to view additional things, we could or if we wanted to log some more interesting information, we could go into our plugin. Let's close this and jump back to our plugin. And we could log something more interesting. So in addition to the name of the method that we happen to be in, maybe we want to know something about the name of the request. So there's our e.request reporting name. We can just do a debug.print on that as well. And if we build, and then run our test one more time. You can see now that the reporting name is listed as category two for that particular request. And so now we're seeing you know, exactly what which test is happening and be very easy for us to add additional debug information within this particular test. So that shows you how you can use the web request plugin and the web test plugin. Remember that the web test plugin applies to the entire web test. The web re uh, test request plugins can be added to individual test requests as needed. Both of these allow you to customize the behavior of your web tests and give you an extensibility point when you're doing more advanced scenarios with your Visual Studio web testing.